Welcome. I'm Lucy Bolivant. I'm one of the trustees of Temple Bar Trust. And um, I am delighted to see everybody here tonight for our latest talk. Trust is wholly committed to creating a culture in which diversity and equality of opportunity are actively promoted. And this is reflected across all our activities. So this leads me on neatly to uh, say that I'm really delighted to welcome our speaker tonight, Miyuwa Oki, President-elect of REBA, who'll be speaking tonight about this tantalizing title, Future, Creative and Irreversible, answering the big question, how do you make a change and deliver a sustainable future? So Miyuwa is an architect trained at Sheffield University and works at Mace Group and he's focused on technology and innovation, specifically delivering off-site off um, manufactured solutions for major estate public programs as a technical assessment lead. And then while working previously at Grimshaw Architects, he founded and chaired the multi-ethnic group and allies network and was instrumental in driving global <coughs> cultural change. Um, for his colleagues, and he was an external speaker, a mentor for aspiring architect, young architects, um, or indeed architects of any age, probably, <laughs> <laughs> for the POC in architecture, Scale Rule, and the Grimshaw Foundation um, program. And all of those exist to encourage greater social mobility within the industry. So throughout his career, he's worked on large-scale infrastructure projects such as HS2 Euston and the North London Heat and Power Network, collaborating with public estate department clients. He contributes to the next generation of architects in his capacity as an ambassador uh, for the Mayor of London Design Future, um, Future London Challenge. And he became president-elect of the RIBA on the 1st of September last year, not only the first black president of REBA, but also the youngest in the entire history. And he takes up his presidency in September of this year for a two-year term. So Thanks, Lucy, for that. Um, that wonderful introduction, that means one page of my my notes at the other side. So, um, where do I start? All of us wrestle with a fear, a terrible fear, and the fear I'm calling it is the fear of failure. Um, and what it does is constantly impedes our creativity. Now, what do we, what are we afraid of? When, when I'm talking about this, this thing about failure. I don't think it's something to do with material suffering because many of us here are above material suffering. Uh, we live in the global West. Uh, we have some safety nest um, in some capacity, although there's quite a lot of um, challenge to that with the current government. Um, we have a system that saves us from the worst kind of material dep deprivation, and that's good. What we don't have is anything that saves us from the consequences of this fear of failure, which is I will travel all in humiliation. This thing that we are terrified about because we haven't really found a way to overcome it. And you might be wondering why am I talking about failure and humiliation at a presentation here at Temple Bar, which is focusing on the city. Because I'm talking about it because um, I ask myself, and I'm also asking you here, it's like, what, are, what is the big challenge? What can be the big challenge in delivery, delivering a sustainable future and a sustainable city? It's the fact that we are afraid of getting it wrong, so we don't try. So it keeps us running on the hamster wheel, keeps us stifled, and keeps us not creative. Um, and it's, it's this fear that I'm talking about, that keep that, that um, the fear of failure, that um, sort of hounds our creative, stifles our creative um, spirit in the corporate and also our personal life. I am the millennial president, first black president of the Royal Institute of British Architects, work at Maze Group. I'm about challenging, I'm about taking names and connecting. 
And I believe we're here to challenge our, ourselves, challenge our minds, challenge our, the way we think, um, and challenge our business as usual um, way of operating in all, in all the different um, ways that we operate. <laughs> um, growing up in Lagos, Nigeria, South London, in Sheffield, um, as a proxy northerner, uh, I've seen the result of lack of investment in creativity in the built environment. Um, and I'm here to give my young, next generation, long term view on the challenges that we face in um, achieving a sustainable future. Um, so when I stood up for, stood for the real president, um, the grass group, with the grass group roots uh, campaign, we focused, I focused alongside the peers on speaking up for what the future architect should look like. Um, I didn't know it then, but the platform I was standing on was a winning one because it was irresistible. It was irresistible to a few uh, cohorts. Young people, it was irresistible to more established practitioners. Um, and I looked creatively at how next generation voices can take responsibility, can take ownership on the built environment and encourage these next generation voices in thought leadership across the built environment. Make our voices heard. I am focused on a future that's agile and accessible and innovative to make architecture and creativity a pillar of the design and construction industry that drives force for good in all creative sectors, digitally and more in more traditional ways as well. But while we're at it, I'm also here because um, I was talking about speaking up for the future architect, talking about how architects can be more aspirational and thinking about how we can be paid well for the value that we create in the built environment. So that's me at, in the Hustons in some last summer. So how do you make a change and deliver a sustainable future? My answer is by being creative and making the change that you want to see irresistible. The American author Tony K. Bamber said, the creative's role is to make the revolution irresistible. I believe that to build a more sustainable future, we must all be creatives. And I know most of us here are creatives, and some of us are creatives. And those who don't feel like creative, I implore you to think, carry on, carry your creative jacket, your helmet, your, your pen, um, and wrestle the narrative and the use of the term creative to make it non-pejorative term, a non-pejorative term. And I remember, I kind of see this in my everyday life, uh, because when I, I remember watching um, a Channel 4 documentary, Dispatches, about um, energy from waste facilities, somewhat, something that I'm kind of interested in because I worked on the North London Heater Power Project. And the presenter used the term quite often, creative accounting, in the pejorative term, meaning that someone the people who were in used, doing the project were in some ways lying or in 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 a in in, the, in a more more sinister way were um, in breaking the law and it's this language of the creative being an obstruction to um, to prosperity or to um, a function and, and a form um, is something that we as, as all of us here need to wrestle with and, and, and claim, reclaim. And in this revolutionary time, we need to amaze people as well into changing course because as humans, we learn through irresistible stories and precedents. And we need to be telling these stories and making sure that the precedents that we set are of the highest standards. So what's the scale of the issue that we're facing in our cities? 
Um, humans have already caused an average of uh, one point one one degree above one degree uh, of global warming, and we're on a path to exceeding the one point five degrees target. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change spells out how much difficult it will be for the world to stay under this 1.5 degrees uh, uh, limit unless we drastically slash our emissions in a very short space of time. And based on the current emissions, our current emissions, the world will likely hit 2.7 uh, 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 or 3.1 uh, degrees of warming by the year 2100. Basically, as we, have, we, we, we know and we hear quite a lot, um, the world is burning up. Uh, also, by the year 2100, if the United Nations is to be believed, the world will have a population of almost what, 11 billion pe people. That's 3 billion people more than the planet houses today. <coughs> What's the issue here? Why am I telling you all of this? To house these three billion people, we need to build about 2.4 trillion square feet of space, civic space. That's the equivalent of adding a New York City every month to the planet for the next 40 years to address the challenge. And to address this, we need to be a lot creative about the solution that we provide. So, I mean, I don't want to lecture and quote stats and give figures and things like that, but I want to persuade all of us here to always remember something that I hold dear, the truth that I hold dear, that to be an innovator, um, you have to be creatively minded. And remember to make this creative proposition irresistible. So that's my young, long-term view. And why cities? Well, cities are the big deal, right? We all have to live in them. Uh, we are focused on them here at the Temple Bar Trust. Um, so we should try to make them right in lots of different contexts. And make them context-specific, actually. And it's my view that so many few cities, so few cities are nice, very few cities are appealing. Embarrassingly though, the more appealing ones are the older ones. So this is more, this is more newer cities um, all around the globe as a sample. And as, because I said the, the, the more appealing ones are the, the older ones, it's, it's kind of weird because we are better at doing stuff now than we were back in the day. So our cars, our planes, our phones um, are more better than they were before. So why not cities? And how did we get there? Um, I think it's because of mass production in some ways. And like consumer goods, um, we mass produce glass and the, the materials, glass, steel, plasterboard, and we deploy them in a very similar way across the globe in our cities. And in, in doing this, we make our cities and its buildings and the systems that it's built on not resistible. And not resistible environmentally, aesthetically, socially appealing. It's just about the economics. And I want to challenge that. And, and I want to, to, to end by encouraging everyone now that we are considering setting ourselves free from fear and from humiliation, the fear that kind of impedes our creativity um, and also makes us do the status quo, um, we should now be able to go out, take a calculated risk, um, and um, make calculated mistakes to ensure that our cities are irresistible, far and wide, and gear and encourage our creative sides towards making the most important things, making our cities sustainable for the future. Because um, 
as Nietzsche told us, no creativity can occur without accommodating failure. Thank you for listening. That was very thought-provoking. Um, I, th I have loads of questions, but I think it's almost unfair for me to hog the platform because I'd love to talk to you about the, the um, policies on which you campaigned yeah. and you were successful. Um, they cover, you know, cradle to cradle accreditation and rewards, quarterly Reba Town Halls, yeah. devolution to, uh, you know, speed up greater uh, democracy, yeah. mandate overtime pay, a workers' uh, uh, first approach. Yeah. But somehow you, you've, um, in your talk today, you've chosen to approach it on a very kind of, um, uh, you know, the creativity is really central to our existence, but it's... Ex it's uh, creativity really, really in, in, um, interwoven with uh, a greater inclusion as well, isn't it? Yeah. So if I ask you that initial question, and then I'll uh, open it to the floor, because I'm sure everyone's got come already with questions. So yeah. perhaps you could maybe connect those two a little bit? Well, overall, the overarching bit about the talk is to make sure that um, the, the, the main thing crux of why I ran for president was to make sure that architects are seen as relevant and creativity and in design and construction is, is paramount to the solutions to um, uh, the issues with the built environment. And it's that demand side issue of the need of, of uh, mm -hmm. the skills that we provide that uh, will bring about uh, touch on all the issues that you've uh, highlighted. So the pay issue, mm -hmm. which is front and center of, uh, I feel like front and center of why I, I'm actually here, uh, which resonated with quite a lot of the next generation, uh, the upcoming architects who were part of the, the, the Reba. So, so it sort of valuing our skills, valuing ourselves, valuing our skills, and communicating that clearly to the people who hire us creatively is, is uh, we'll touch on on those issues and make it make sure that we have a, a voice to demand better really yeah that's a very bold and a very necessary um, stance that you've taken and it's absolutely you know the revolutionary approach that is needed arguably um, when it comes to Reba and so on. So I think I think it'd be really great, given the time factor as well, to get some questions from people. Any any aspect of what Miura said, um, just the micro issues, the macro, the big macro issue of creativity. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll continue your theme. I think and maybe <laughs> maybe challenge a little bit because yeah. architects are inherently creative, which is great. But in terms of the creativity and addressing the, the wider sustainability issues, actually we are a pretty small cog in the wheel because the creators, <coughs> we specify products that are modern, uh, you know, sustainable, designed by others. We work in policy frameworks that are delivered by others. Uh, we, we, you know, procure components which are manufactured by others. And I would say that the creativity in the 21st century is as much down to sort of AI and scientists and others than it ever is for architects and I'm a chartered architect mm -hmm. so you know where do we fit within this because actually the word architect although it's protected uh, under the registration act is used more and more and more by computer technologists and so on and so forth so how do how do we regain it what, what is the creativity given that, that wider creativity is delivered by so many other professionals and industries and sectors. Yeah, that's a fair comment um, because I have seen that as well. The, the term architects is used very sparingly in technology fields. I do think when I come back, when I'm coming back to cities and the built environment, uh, the creativity in that is in, in how, what types of buildings are built how it can uh, accommodate different ten types and tenures of, of, of users, um, the scale at which it's built, and how it relates to the context. Um, that all 
needs creative thought, and it doesn't, there isn't a one size fits all. For example, in a in a an urban uh, development in I worked on urban development in um, Kids Kidbrook in southeast London, and the way in which the urban planning was done was you know not to 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 do a disservice to to that work was it was it was about NIA. Um, it was about what tower do we need to put to put put in the skyline. It wasn't about who's gonna how to engage with the community. <coughs> who are we housing? How are we housing them? Um, and what 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 is what is what is local to that area to make it um, uh, friendly, aesthetically pleasing, um, as also um, environmentally and socially friendly to the to to, to the people. Who are going to actually get to use it? And I'm not. I'm not talking about this just in the UK. I'm talking about it in Nigeria. I'm talking about it in other parts of the world, where those ideas of how to how to do things better for the local community needs to be championed and um, uh, and and uh, and done in a you know in a way that um, it's it it it's, it's it has a sets a precedent for. People to to um, to to live up to really, um, and then to come back to your bit about um, the, we are in a sort of fragmented um, uh, world. I think the materials and the, the building materials that we specify, um, we 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 have that opportunity. We have we we are we have the the the. The opportunity and the 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 the, the, the pen hold with the pen holders, so, so to speak, on how those materials are used. So therefore, um, we can think about how one material, what what the right materials. We need to be in pushing the envelope about materiality, um, but, um, uh, fabric first approaches to design and sustainability, um, and that's all the. <clears throat> All the, the skills that we need to communicate better to to our clients and make sure that it is it, it is is something that um, we are valued for giving. And at the moment, I I, I, I see there is a there's a sort of roadblock, not just um, in the practices that I've worked at, but um, it's just something that um, anecdotally lots of people keep talking about that we don't have a. Uh, uh, a strong enough um, sense of who we are and the value that we bring. Alex? Um, oh, right. question. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, well, first off, th thanks for a sort of a very um, provocative presentation and uh, a sort of reminder, I suppose, that architects can play a role in much bigger thinking than just the realisation of buildings and the sort of relationship you showed between kind of global population growth and the need for new cities or new big ideas that tackle or accommodate that population growth is kind of was very explicitly laid out in your slides. I just wonder, I'm really curious to know what more the RABA could be doing to promote the skills that architects have in city planning, and I know it's something that Lucy kind of talks a lot about in her writings, yeah. but as architects we, you know, 90, I don't know, 95% of architecture practices, ROBA registered practices are sole practitioners or small micro practices, and yet, is it, what is it? I think it's 70. 70, okay, yeah. sorry, over, over, over I did that, but <laughs> I guess, um, you know, the challenge is, we face are much bigger than ones most practices are addressing. Yeah. And I wonder if there's more that the RIBA can be doing in terms of partnerships with RTPI, um, Urban, the uh, Academy for Urbanism, some of the organisations and institutes that are perhaps much more explicitly talking about urbanism, master planning, spatial frameworks that architects arguably have the skills and the pens to yeah. help shape. Okay, so if I summarise the questions, like what can the RIBA do to to tackle these bigger issues? 
And, well, contribute to the debate on, on architecture and urbanism, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess we, we can do quite a lot. Um, and I think it's, if I think about thinking outside the box here, um, there's quite a lot of work done in different spheres in the, in the built environment um, institutes. So ICE does their thing. Uh, CIOB does their own thing, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the joined up thinking coalescing around an is, in a single issue would be a would be my tactical strategy of, of, of doing that. So Lucy, for example, is is quite prominent and interested in in, in retrofit as I, I as I am and most of you here. And I think that's another sort of um, avenue skills um, in in to to take up and um, sort of show our leadership skills, um, creating, and, and, and with the RIB, we can create a framework for um, architects to be able to show those skills. So um, I know these different types of uh, projects have like uh, advisory boards, for example. Um, we, could, we could try to set up uh, a methodology for different types of clients to set up advisory boards, including which, which can include architects, um, and also do some joined up thinking with other built environment um, uh, uh, institutes. So, for example, like what was said uh, about people, uh, different different groups that that work with materials, um, the work with technology, um, and bring that sort of joined up thinking um, in the sort of avenue of the area of, 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 of the architect, where the architects can have an input. So it's, it's to do with more collaboration, joined up thinking with our institutes, and, um, and also setting up a, a sort of a framework for people to engage better with, with architects. Let's go ahead. So I'm less worried about the, our creativity, I think, English architects are renowned throughout the world and appreciated around the world for their creativity. And the forthcoming degree shows and diploma shows, when you go around them, there's, there's no doubt about the creativity of our profession. And if you look at the RIBA annual survey for the last five years, the one thing that our clients say we're good at is creativity. What they say we're bad at is managing and making sure we listen to them and give them what they want or give them exceed their expectations. So I'm interested in how we do that, how the RIBA maintains any semblance of relevance in architectural education or in the politics, the, the influence that we have. I, th I think the days of the RIBA being a members club it should be over and it needs to be seen more as a qualification. The letters RIBA should stand for something, and at the moment they don't. Nobody in our office of 200 people wants to join the RIBA. We have to pay for them to join so that we can remain a chartered practice, and that's outrageous in itself. Yeah. That's, you know, that's a, a blackmailing, saying we've got to pay for 80% of our architects to join just so as we can have a chartered practice which doesn't actually mean anything to anybody other than we think it's a nice badge to have. So I'd, I'd really, not. I think creativity, we've got it in abundance, relevance, none at all. How do you think we should get that relevance? Right? So I, I, my, when I was on the board of the RIBA, I suggested that CPD really needs to be tightened up you can't get an hour for going to a double glazing salesman's talk in the lunchtime and have sandwiches. You have to make the CPD, lifelong learning, really relevant. We should make it more onerous. You shouldn't be able to join, rejoin the RIBA every year unless you've done proper accredited CPD. You then wouldn't probably have things like Renfield happening because we would know what we should do to avoid those sorts of things. And we make it really relevant. You, you have to do 50 hours, you have to do one hour a week, dedicated learning. But then when it was put to the membership, they said, well, why 
do we want to pay 400 quid a year for something that's going to be harder to join? Well, the answer is, because then you would be joining something that's relevant and you can tell politicians and clients and everybody else in the industry that having the letters after your name actually means something, which it doesn't at the moment. I totally agree, Chris. I think you've nailed it on the issue there, because I think you've got a very, you know, it's a really nice uh, idea, this, of creativity, but I do think it's a, sort of the obvious point about architects. You don't have to try and tell everyone that we need to be more creative. It's, it's there. But I do think the respect for architects is is really lacking because of the you know why do you, why do why do, why are project managers employed all the time? It's not because um, you know people like project managers. It's probably because they need to make sure the architect performs. And if we were performing better, we probably would need less project managers. So I do think there's an issue there. You need to target in on in your in your presidency. Just really focus in on that because I think you it's going to be very hard for you at the beginning because you're going to have a big you want to get in there and really be focused at the beginning on a really tight agenda you don't want to make it too wide and um, you know, I think that's uh, a challenge you're going to have yeah. Yeah. Um, okay uh, I've got a question. Um, so coming, coming, uh, kind of wrapping all that up, in my opinion, with the idea of us being like a cog in the wheel as, as architects, I think the way you respond to that is with collaboration in the whole industry, so with, 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 with the contractor, with everyone, so that you, you get more out of it. But then when you come into these barriers that you come into with architecture, like like not, not, not being employed in the same way we are, project managers, et cetera, et cetera, how do you then deal with that? So if you're trying to convince a developer, if you're trying to convince all of these people to take take architects more seriously, how does the RBA work in within that? Do they, you know, I think when you talk about the memberships, or in, in even even in how we work as architects, do you make it, have the how can the RBA play more of a role in the construction industry to collaborate more? So it becomes less independent, I suppose, is my question. Um, I think we could do that by um, being uh, being local. Um, so, given the different the nations and regions, um, some jurisdiction to to and tools to engage with their local mayors, local uh, leaders, um, and so that it doesn't all come from London. Um, that's one thing that I, I campaigned on and also something that um, I'm interested in understanding how to, to deliver in, in office. Um, and two, it'll be to, um, we have a, a policy team um, and it's to scale up that policy team, um, touching on the, the key issues of the day, climate and sustainability, something that I'm super interested in. Um, and engaging meaningfully with uh, the different departments that uh, that, 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 that intersects the built environment. So um, DLUC being one of them, um, and all, make, making sure that we are the first port of call when there is um, with issues to do with like a policy or issues to do with um, the built environment. I think those are a couple of ways that I would I would uh, tackle that issue. And going back on, um, sorry, go ahead. And go going, ahead. Going on, on, on your point about um, <coughs> the relevance of architects in general and RIVA, I think yes, that that's that is one way the CPD, which is the, the learning. Um, but I also think it's about the conversation and how the tools in which we have we use to pitch ourselves to the to, to the outside world. Um, and um, I think the RIBA could, could give give the 70% of small practices those tools in, in how to like um, engage with clients, etc. Um, and, and and make sure that you know as a community we value our time, value our services, value the the the, um, the the input 
that we, we, we bring to, to the industry. And I think if all of us think about each other as one community as opposed to us, you know, uh, fighting each other for uh, scraps of fees, I think that's, that's, that's a way to, um, to solve that issue, if you know, one of those issues, yeah. Definitely, the man in the cream jacket and then Martin in the back. Richard Dajitsky. Um, I'm an architect as well as being a passive house consultant, so I do a lot of this sort of stuff. Um, one of the things that I um, sort of think is you talk about creativity, and the creativity is effectively drawn when one does look at regeneration projects through risk. And, uh, you know, most, most of the surrounding people around us tend to knock down this risk quite often. Shortly, a system whereby architect-led development, so architect as developer, is a good way forward when we're looking at sort of regeneration and sustainable type scenarios um, or projects when we're looking at regeneration cities. I mean, I'm from Peckham, some South London. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so for me, it's very much about regenerating certain areas and looking at those, but trying to make it architect-led and I think that architect-led is about trying to get people to believe in your idea and, and, and give you money as a developer, effectively. Yeah. I think all the successful projects that I've had, or the practice has had, um, has been done primarily because we've had backing and we've bought the buildings ourselves. Yeah? And I think that's, as an architect-led development, I think that's, surely that's the way, that's the way forward. Because whether you, whatever you do with this later on, that, that, that shows and it proves to other people what we can and what we can't, you know, what we can and what we can't deliver. Yeah. So that, I mean, I've never done that. I've heard about it. Uh, for example, Squire and Partners do that quite a lot as well. Yeah. Um, exactly. And, I mean, it'd be great to talk to you and uh, sort of showcase the, the breadth, the length and breadth of the different types of ways of practicing as an architect. Um, and, and, and yeah, from one of the challenges that I, when I talked to during the Hustings was like, you know, there, there needs to be like a variety of, 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 of how architect is, is presented to the public as, as opposed to just that, you know, star person in, 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 uh, that, that owns a, 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 a practice or something. And I think what you're saying in, you know, architects who take some of the risk well, as, a, as, a, as a developer is a way. Um, someone who is more of an advisory side on big um, urban regeneration projects is, a, is another way. Um, someone doing, you know, uh, house extensions as well is, is also a valued member of the community. I think that sort of plethora if be something that mm -hmm. is incumbent on Reba and also incumbent on us as, as the community. Telling us, telling our stories far and wide, so that you know there's a demand. We're addressing, we're, we're we're talking to people where they are, and also telling them how valuable the creativity yeah, can be yeah, to their lives. But my, my question really is: Will the RIBA support more architect-led development? Will we be able to sort of bring those cogs a little bit more together? Because I found it always quite difficult over the last thirty odd years in running a practice to do that. I found it more something which stifled me rather than actually allowed me to grow. I agree with the point about chartered practice because I find that quite difficult as well. We're a twelve-strong team, and it's quite you know that is is really really difficult. And it's damn expensive, and it doesn't give you a great deal of benefit. I also feel that really um, we, we as a practice find a lot of the rules and implementation of what the RIBA effectively stands for. Sometimes, oh, am I breaking it a little bit here? Can I do this or can I not do this? And it's, um, it's quite difficult to, to, to play that path. And, um, you know, as an architect developer, which is what we do primarily, it's sort of, um, it's, it's a difficult role. And um, yeah, it's a difficult role. So, what what has been your challenges in in engagement with Reba so far? The engagement with Reba, in terms of the challenges, it's knowing the rules as an architect. Whether you are um, when you're looking at 
developing something specifically for a client with your own building firm or doing something of that nature. And it's about the challenges and the cross, uh, basically conflict of interests effectively right. on that basis. And that's where it does become really, really quite awkward. And there are, you know, there are different ways of procuring, um, procuring works, but that's where I've, um, I've found it difficult, to be honest. Okay. I can be more specific, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, so maybe we can have a chat later on, yeah. 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 I interject just a thought, which sure, is yeah. a good example, is George Ferguson, who's a past president of Rebrew, of course. Yeah and was a developer architect in, in Bristol, and then actually became the mayor of Bristol. <laughs> so maybe there should be a, a conversation with, with George. I'm sure he's down the line. Or you become the London mayor, absolutely. <laughs> Martin. Martin, and then... And then George. Um, so I belong to a demographic that is definitely not the future in our industry. Um, and I'm obsessed about the people who are future in our Industries I'm a developer um, and uh, spend most of my day working with architects. And whilst the young people in our business might not have many of the answers, or certainly they're the least knowledgeable people by definition in our industry, in our businesses, they are most definitely the ones asking all the right questions. And they're the ones with the most passion for finding the answers to those mm -hmm. questions that we're all struggling to do. And in my business, I know we're not listening enough. And in our industry, we're not listening enough. And when I say listening, I mean listening to the questions that they're asking and understanding why those people are asking those questions and helping and they're working together to find some answers to those questions. So I know that in your two years, you're going to be asked to solve all the problems. Um, as the <laughs> um, and I know from very long experience that you're going to struggle to find hardly any of the answers to the questions in that role. But all, all I would like to do is to urge you to throw the doors open of that building to the young people of our industry and use your power and your position and that building, which is just so drowned in mud and mm. torpor, to um, let young people take it over. I mean, I want people hanging out of the windows, waving banners, full of events, full of voices, full of young people screaming and shouting about the fact that we're not listening to them. And if you could do one thing, I would just urge you, do that. <laughs> I, I want to add, as a, as a young person, uh, I can see that Reba, so 66 Portland Place where Reba's based, they are um, begin, beginning to open their doors. Like recently, um, so I was part of this uh, nylon program with Homegrown Plus and we were, you, you spoke at that event and that was the first time for me that I felt like Reba was open, open to young people. Um, it was the first time that I'd been at, at Reba for an event and it was a really fantastic event. Um, it was celebrating the uh, last year's cohort um, of that program. Um, and I just, it would be amazing to see more, more events like that and also uh, I'm linking back to the CPD thing. I feel like it'd be amazing to have um, rather well. CPDs are, are brilliant, but but in the in the vein of CPD, maybe having more uh, peer peer to peer CPDs, where it's all well and good listening to lectures and like being talked at by well, well professionals in their industry, but I feel like something amazing is that um, I feel like smaller practices in particular can learn a lot from each other, um, those 70%. So uh, at AHMM we do uh, an architecture foundation um, residency um, and talking with them, from, from them um, I've gathered that their real, the real value in it is talking to the other practices, having the space, that's important, so Reba opening up its doors. Not only that, facilitating conversations, not just Reba talking at people, but facilitating the conversations between smaller practices and getting them in a room together to talk about these issues and share, share their problems, share, share what's going on in their practices, and then others offering up solutions, discussing like that. Um, I feel like there's a real um, just opportunity for this. I would quite like to echo that as an architectural um, apprentice. 
So I feel I've, I'm in my last year of it in the four years. And I feel, especially because I've got a lot of friends who are doing their part twos and part threes normally, I feel like I have experienced a lot of understanding behind, behind why things are happening, how things happen in the actual industry. And I think with the actual way we're educated as architects as well, the RBA can be a huge facilitator to that, not, not even in changing the course, in having CPDs that you can come to in-house where you, like you say, immerse yourself with different generations of architects where the young get voiced and the old, like, you kind of learn from each other. And I think that that would be, I'm completely with you on that. I'd really like to echo that idea. Yeah. Please, let's go ahead and then Simone. Oh, another one. Okay. So you go first, <laughs> then Simone, and then... And then Chris. Yep. Okay, thanks. So, so my name's Helen. I'm a director at Scott Browning, so I'm one of the larger practices. <coughs> um, and I just wanted to focus on the irresistible bit because I think we've talked about creative bit a lot, and I like, I really like that principle, that idea that you know why wouldn't people come to you? And I remember talking um, pre-COVID to um, a, a consultant about the idea of change and how you make why change happens. And she said at the time, you know, it only happened through fear or love. And I think we saw that in COVID. Our capacity for change through fear was incredible. Like, we were able to do that. And what we need to do is obviously get people to feel the love and want that change that we want them to, to happen. But I think one of the challenges, and having been involved in the RBA for a long time, like Chris and people like that, and having seen that difficulty, is that we don't speak with the same voice at all. And, you know, whether or not you're an RBA member, whether or not you're qualified, we are a very, you know, we are diverse and that's great. But, you know, we're developers, we're project managers, we do all sorts of different things. But it means that we don't potentially have that that shared voice that might help us elevate our message and and help us come together and i'm just interested to you know to what you think about that idea about whether we need something you know a single thing that we can all sign up to so that we can you know whatever we're doing whatever, however we're doing it we can actually we all feel like we're moving in the same direction because i just don't feel we're quite there at the moment yeah i I, yeah, I agree with some of the messages that you said uh, here. Uh, and I think, like I said earlier, it could be it could be retrofit, it could be other things. And I disagree a little bit that we're um, we're not in one voice or we're not talking talking to each other. I think we are talking to each other, but we're doing it in very disparate spaces. Um, and uh, I think there needs to be a, like a coalition co coalescent on like something that's bigger than all of us, bigger than um, the bottom line, um, and communicating that reciprocally to the people who will demand the services that uh, that we, we, we provide. Um, and I I I I think it could it's, it's something to do with sustainability um, because it's what's the biggest challenge of our generation, um, and it's. How, how do we contribute to that conversation um, con and contribute meaningfully as well? Um, and I, I think, yes, it's to do with the RIBA needs to take up that mantle piece in, 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 um, in communicating to its membership and also the wider architectural profession to be say that you know, sustainability is important. We need to be carbon literate, we need to be, uh, we think about ESG first. Um, but yes, I, I, I agree with you that um, it, love or hate, but love or fear will, will drive, drive our, our emotions and the stories will drive our, 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 our action. And I think um, we just need to, um, we just need to uh, be able to communicate slightly better and all of us communicate slightly better uh, in doing so. Simone. Yeah, and my name is Simone de Gaulle. I'm a chartered architect and I run a business in Belgravia and I, I actually sit on the board of the REBA as an honorary treasurer so it's really interesting to hear all the feedback coming back at the moment and I just wanted to say that I think that the REBA we have been trying to do a lot more um, to, to make the membership worthwhile for its members. Um, the REBA, we've gone through a big governance restructure over the last uh, few years. It was 2020 when the new structure came into, um, was 
you know, was made law. And we've been working through that and trying to build up the board and the council um, and the executive team so that it can give its members more for its money so that the membership can see why it's worthwhile to become a member. And I think that the best way that the REBA can support its members is to support competency of architects and the ways that we've been looking to, um, to support architects through through the rebar are um, in particular the current theme that we're discussing is um, about the CPD, about having better, more robust CPD, in particular with the new principal designer role um, which is coming out and having the um, correct mandatory competencies. We're looking at how we can incorporate that into the CPD offerings for for the membership and we've been working very closely with the ARB so that we can be more aligned with the requirements in terms of registration and then um, at being a chartered architect. And then another thing that we've been um, looking at and developing is um, the idea of a practice in a box. So um, for like small practices, uh, the sort of support you might need for administrative purposes, you know, mm -hmm. health and safety, um, policies, um, et cetera, and legal advice, we've been um, packaging that so that the, the part of the membership, the, the practice can like, you know, have that as a selection as part of their membership. So there might be opportunity to look at maybe packages for architect developers in the future, um, maybe architectural AI, you know, um, um, experts and things in the future. So I think there's definitely a, um, a bright light or a light that, you know, we've we've uh, been able to crack through and, and start to shine. And I think Mia, Mia who attends our board meetings as, as an observer, you're, you'll be well placed to take the reins and, and lead on. Well, well, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris, thanks. Yeah, hi, I'm Chris, Chris Dyson. I'm currently the master at this um, delivery as we met earlier. And um, I, I just wanted to say a few things because it's towards the end of the evening, but um, we architects love a good party. <laughs> and we had um, a wonderful speech given by Anne Gale um, a few weeks ago which described one of the fundamental characteristics of a good city is a place you'd like to hang around in as if you were at a good party and never leave. And I think um, we could learn a lot from that as architects designing buildings and being braver with our clients, being braver with our, those people that surround our industry, <laughs> challenging them. And I think the RIBA, if it was to run one good place, it would become a good party venue. <laughs> but for the architects, and um, I think I think that's something we all need to sort of identify with. If we feel relaxed, to be creative, you need to be relaxed. You need to be in a form of mind, which is a relaxed form of mind, and that is something we should in, we should amongst fellowship, amongst our own people. Yeah. As architects, we should be able to create that, and it's not that difficult. I think it's all about taking that initiative. I would love to see how you might do that. Open the doors. Yeah. yeah, open the doors, it's really important. Um, let's have two more questions, then we'll adjourn for drinks, right? And then we can carry on with the questions yeah. informally. Right. Yeah. Um, Phil. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm Phil Cooper. I, I have been an architect developer in a very small way in the suburbs in South London. Um, it seems to me that your enthusiasm for architecture and creativity as its role in actually solving a massive problem that we've actually got to love, uh, otherwise we're gonna to coast towards an Armageddon well after I'm dead, but not that long away, um, requires the RIBA to have, be seen to have a rele rele relevance, not just the RIBA, because can almost forget the RIBA. We need people that are creative and professional who are going to get out there and help society to, to change. Because it's society that has to change to achieve your goals, and architects will have a role, but will only have a role if society feels that they are relevant. And I think, having gone through my profession, my career, it has been always sad to me how our profession isn't actually valued, and I don't actually understand how 
you see that changing? We've had, we've, we've had a talk about the pandemic and how creative we were, but at the same time, Gove came out and said, we've got too many experts. And I think the architects are seen as experts, experts that can be dismissed, ignored, mm -hmm. put to one side. I was in the house building industry. I, was, I went along to resign from the RIBA because I wasn't allowed to, be, to become a director in any company at the time, or let alone, God forbid, in a building company. I went to resign, and luckily for me, the rules would, had been changed the night before. So I became the first. But I went into an industry where there were no architects on the boards of any house building company, and never had been. And people were lamenting the standard of house building, but no architects were there. And actually, I have to say, there are probably very few architects on the boards of house building companies even now, this far I on. Was one. Well, <laughs> Valerie was one. But, uh, I, you know, I, I, I eventually joined a, a company where there were 300 employees and there was one architect and his status in the company was, was lowest of the low in the company. So you, you've got a big, a big job to do to get society to value architects. I think we value each other whatever we try and do and get, get, get on with. But unless clients and, and society as a whole and politicians I, I can't see how it's going to change that much. I'm sorry. What do you feel? Do you, do you feel you can get society to value architects? Not in two years, no. No. Because no. <laughs> that's, that's a big undertaking. But in enough time to make the change that is necessary. Yes, I, I, be, I believe so. I think, I think part of what I was talking about in the campaign, and which, which is something I'm really interested in, is this idea of architecture beyond, architects beyond boundaries. I, I believe I was kind of a little bit outside of the, the trajectory of a quintessential architect because I work at Mason, a consult, consultants and construction company. And it's that conversation about what do architects do and where do they, where are they? And how can they practice in the different ways? So we're talking about uh, as it's been a, a, a client uh, architecture-led developer. Um, there's folks who are doing more consultancy work, advisory work, feasibility work, management, design management work. And I think it's this plethora of, of the roles of an architect and the people, the, per the personnel, the individual who are, who are in those roles to feel comfortable enough to talk about their architectural skills in the environment that they are, but also be part of a community of architects. And I think that community of architects is the RIBA. And I think it's that opening the door and showcasing the fact that you can be all these things and still be an architect. You can be on the board of a housing, housing corporation and, and be an architect. And I think that message has been lost over the years because it's been, you have to, not have to, but the architect is that star person who, you know, is on AJ only, um, or AJ or Zine and wins the Pulitzer Prize. And I think, yes, all of that, those, the, those high level architects are great, but also the communication of the other roles that we do and the value it brings to the built environment is as important. And it's something that I want to focus on in the two years. Okay. Can, I, can I just say, sorry, I'm just thinking to myself as you were saying that, if I say, if I say I'm an architect in the school playground, people are like, oh, that's really good. If I say that in a meeting, they are, you know, they're not in, yeah, I'm, I'm not powerful. And I think there, there's some disconnect there going on. It is, you know, that the word architect still has some level of respect generally for people who don't know, you know, necessarily what we do, but within the construction industry, we have been sidelined and sidelined and sidelined, and we've let it happen. So I think that's you know that's why I hope the Building Safety Act will actually have a positive impact. It's really challenging. It's a massive challenge, but I'm hoping that that will help because people will have to employ 
you know, competent people, and we're the, we're the only regulated profession. Yeah. So I do hope that will have positive impact. We have some something to do with that. We are we're, we're bringing together this uh, principal designer and taking taking up that. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 Which is really important, isn't it? But the yeah. issue is if 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 architects don't take up the principal designer role, then yeah, you know, because there will be other. Um, professionals yeah. looking to take up that role. Yeah. Okay. It's not going to automatically go to us. So. Right, it's that moment of the final question, and then we can carry on talking at this high level in over a drink. Yeah, please go ahead. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for opening your talk with acknowledging that that fear of failure, and, and that we should unshackle ourselves from that, so thank you for that. Um, the, the question I've got is actually more about youth and enthusiasm, and for that group that just come out of a university process are still working on what for now is their part three, but are not yet chartered architects. How do you capture them and, and get them excited about being an associate member of the organization and, and leverage their enthusiasm to, to work and contribute their enthusiasm and ideas to sustainability? I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm, I'm not open to ideas on that, uh, personally. Uh, I was an associate, uh, Reba Preston, and I, I just did that just because, really. Um, and I, yeah, I need to talk, listen to a few people, people who are actually there right now, um, and understand what it is that they they want to contribute and, and see how to facilitate that. Uh, I don't have that answer right now. <laughs> but thanks for the question. Okay, right. Well, thank you so much, Miyu. It's been a, an extraordinarily valuable platform tonight, and yeah. uh, everybody will within a matter of days, if they wish to go and check the video, which will be on the Temple Bar um, website, but also on our YouTube um, page as well. Um, and then you can remind yourself of the really rich, far-ranging uh, nature of the conversation. So it's been uh, probably of all the events we've had, we've had more audience questions uh, in relation to the length of the tour, <laughs> which is probably exactly as it should be. So, yeah. and you have been listening very well, and um, hopefully this has given you a lot of galvanised your yeah. thoughts, yeah. Yeah, um, given you a lot of, of ideas, yeah. on top of all the ideas you already have. <laughs> and let's um, face failure uh, and success and deal with deal with what happens. So it's very true that two years is not a long period of time, but um, we uh, wish you the very best of luck. <laughs> Thank you very much for all your amazing questions. And, uh, <laughs>